the Doorbench Radio Show, the official podcast of Doorbench.com. Welcome to the Doorbench Radio Show. I am your host, Vin Corigliano of Avum Technology in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm joined again co-hosting today by Pete Brown from Microsoft in Maryland in the United States. Pete, how you going, mate? Uh, I'm doing really well. Like last night was a gorgeous night. I got the telescope out. I actually got to see some stars. So I'm, I'm in a good mood today. Awesome. Now, today we have a very special guest and that is Anched. Nortosht Burst. Now, I do hope that I've got that uh, at least vaguely close. <laughs> that was a valiant effort right there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, Angst is the founder of Propellerhead Software. Uh, now, they were one of the core pioneers of the emerging music technology arena in the mid to late 90s, uh, with several of their products achieving what I, what I can only be called... Uh, cult-like status, um, and that's no small claim, but I, firmly, I actually firmly believe that. Uh, welcome, Anched. Thank you. And that, thanks for the effort in pronouncing my name. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard even for Swedish people, so you're, you're doing really well. Oh, thank you very much. And look, you're most welcome. And look, thank you for, um, for uh, actually giving us your time and energy today, because that, uh, you know, you are one of the guys that was on my bucket list, believe it or not, uh, to actually have mm. on the show. So um, let's kick in. I think, uh, oh, look, I haven't had um, any history with you personally, but I mean, with your software, obviously, uh, just riding that whole wave in that early to mid 90s, um, that's, you know, every release of that, those three pieces of software. So, you know, recycle, rebirth, and reason for me, and I don't use the word lightly, but they were pretty much game changing at every stage. Um, mm. So, uh, though we don't have any personal history, I have had uh, a huge history with your software. But I do believe you and Pete have had some um, communication in the past. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, we were, you know, the company's been doing Windows software for a long, long time. Uh, we were actually multi-platform pretty early. So we've had lots of support from from Microsoft in um, getting things running right and, and getting the word out to the market. And Pete's been part of that effort. Yeah, I've been really excited to have you on here today. Thank you. Awesome. Um, all right, well, let's, let's kick straight into it. I think the, the uh, what would be really great, uh, Ange, would be to, if you can give just an overview for the listeners of your history uh, in uh, music, computers and technology uh, leading up to uh, your uh, eventual founding of uh, Propellerhead, uh, I think that would be mm. an awesome place to start. Yeah. You just um, to put that in there to not confuse any listeners. The the name of the company isn't Propellerhead anymore. It's now called Reason Studios. Yes, yes, I do understand that. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So everybody knows that we're talking about the same company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I came out of high school not do knowing what to do with my life work wise. Um, you know, I'd been playing in bands, doing music, had a lot of interest in technology, you, you know, but no real aspirations to be an engineer. So I was looking for, for some idea of how can I combine my interest in music with, <clears throat> with products and, and tech. And mm -hmm. there really wasn't, there wasn't, I mean, there was no course at a university yeah. that I could take. There was nothing there. So I started working for this company. That imported um, synth stuff into Sweden, both wholesale and, and uh, retail, and we did rental as well. And mm -hmm. so, and so, we were representing companies like Sequential and Emu and Simmons and Synergy, and you know all those cool synth companies in the eighties. All the big names. All all the big names, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And what what um, what year was that? What era was that? Well, this is. Um, when can this, this must have been, you know, um, 
really early 80s. Right. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, and then uh, the, people wanted to use synths in studios, and in Sweden, no one had really figured out how they worked, and I had. So, I got a lot of calls to go into um, studios and do what at the time was called synth programming, yeah. which is a little bit funny, <laughs> but that meant you setting the knobs in the right sound to get, you know whatever string sound that they had heard on, on another album. Yes. And programming sequencers and drum machines and stuff. So I did that for a while. And then I I own music as well for commercial purposes, and, you know, for TV and radio and stuff. And then I started writing about music technology. And then one day this guy wandered into my office. His name is Marcus Settekist. Mm-hmm. And he showed me some stuff that he had programmed. Um, and I actually had seen some of it before. He had done an editor for the Ensonic EPS, and he had done he had done a, a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for someone to partner with um, because he knew that he could code anything that, but he was just he just wasn't as sure. He was just wasn't sure about exactly what would fly commercially. Right. So he was looking for a partner that could help him with that work. So that was a partnership that lasted for, I don't know, more than 20 years. Yeah. 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 And then a third guy, Peter Jubel, also um, was there in founding the company. He came in. Well, we started working with him uh, in the recycle period, but he formally joined the company during the rebirth project. So he and he's the DSP wizard the dsb god of everything we did right so what what was the timeline so um um with marcus um i think you mentioned to me in, in one of our pre-chats that you uh, you guys had done something previous to propeller head um yeah well the first thing we did was he had read about this thing this awesome concept in a computer magazine that you could have text on the screen mm -hmm. and then you would have like a word in bold or in another color and if you would click on that word with your mouse that would take you to some other piece of text <laughs> right <laughs> it's just an amazing concept right there was an article about it in dr dobbs journal so he said this is you know this is cool uh, i want to try this concept out so we built a book about how to use midi with your computer which we sold to steinberg it was called midi explained and uh, they they bundled that with a lot of their software i remember that <laughs> you do yes okay. yeah i do remember that book yeah <laughs> And then uh, we we did um, then we did a, a, a like a little application, really cool sequencer for a lighting console, sort of on commission. Except they didn't pay us. Right, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. not the best. Uh, <laughs> yeah, which was uh, a, com a a beautiful program, but a complete flop because we hadn't done our commercial homework, and we just found out after the project was finished that no one in their sane mind on a theater would rely on a, having a computer. Um, you know, to control anything in a in a, in the theater. Yeah, they were just not comfortable with that. So much have so much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then after that, we um, we did recycle. Right. Yeah. So that was sort of the start of everything. So that was uh, let me get this uh, 1994, if I'm correct. Yes. Yeah, we released it in '94. Right. Yeah, and that was. Uh, Look, I, I, I still remember when that product was first released and in that, that you know, middle 90s, uh, the electronic um, music uh, uh, area was um, exploding and expanding at an amazing rate. And then, uh, you know, that recycle just with the capability of being able to manage and manipulate those, those uh, sampled loops, that was, you know, quite... Again, I'm going to say it, but but that did change the game for that electronic dance music and all of the different styles that actually eventuated from all of, from the manipulation that that recycle um, gave the capability to do. It was really cool. I remember the Chemical Brothers saying in an interview there that they wouldn't have existed if Recycle hadn't been there. Wow! <laughs> right. So that was really cool at the time. You know, having that kind of for for. Three guys in a garage, which wasn't really a garage, but sort of, you know, that was a really cool experience for us. 
to Vin's point here, I I don't think these products get the kind of industry or community recognition for what they really did start back then. Like everybody thinks of certain dolls now and then say that like, hey, they've created entire genres of music. But really, this is this is what really did it in the early nineties. Everybody oh, had this. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, no, def- definitely. Thank uh, you. And um and, and just to go full uh, circle, I've got a funny little uh, comment that I'll share from one of my uh, industry friends, and he he just posted a bit of a rant, and he's a mastering engineer here in Australia, but he posted a bit of a rant saying, can we just retire recycle? <laughs> because apparently, <laughs> because apparently, as apparently it, it, he was doing some mastering, and it and it wasn't an electronic genre. Apparently, it was like a rock, and these guys have been, they were, you know, uh, time, uh, Time manipulating all the loops with, with yeah. you know, in a rock song. He's going, can we just please retire? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, time stretch didn't exist at the time, so this was our way of sort of inventing a, w- a way to to change the tempo of things. Yeah, um, you know, the, but that that technology wasn't really there then that, that we use now. Yeah, and the computer technologies back then weren't overly powerful. You know, so um, and yeah. the only the only other way to manipulate the loops back then were the the hardware samplers, and some of them were good, some of them were not so good. So this was again, it it did um, shift. Um, we'll call it it was a paradigm shift for the electronic music when that yeah. first landed. So that was great. Now, interestingly, with um, with recycle. Um, you partnered up with Steinberg. So can you yes, tell us a little bit did. about that partnership? Well, we had worked with them, both me and Marcus had worked with them previously. I was actually writing all the documentation for Cubase. I even started with Pro24. Oh, um, right. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Yeah. So that was me. If you didn't understand the program, that's my fault. No, no, no. No, those, <laughs> those, I used to study those manuals at night away from the computer. I'd just, I'd just sit in bed yeah. and read the things. And that's how I actually, and then I'd go back to the sequencer, you know, on the good old Atari day, and I'd, I'd go, wow, I actually know what I'm doing here. But that was because I'd be reading it and then going, I remember how to do that, and bang, and then just hit hit whatever um, process that I needed to do and editor. And, uh, and those manuals were great, uh, Ange. Uh, huh. Yeah, they, they were and, great. And Marcus was doing some, some work, some coding work for them. The, the thing I can remember now was that he did, in, in Cubase, he did the master track, meaning a tempo editor that they... Yes, when they put that in, that yep. was that was his work. Right. So we already had a, a, a really good relation with them, and you know they're really great people. So and we had no no muscle uh, to do any marketing or any distribution at the time. So we asked them whether they would be interested in in distributing the product, um, and they said yes. Yeah. So it was actually called Steinberg Recycling. Yes, I do remember and, that, yeah. yeah. Right, and then we, we had negotiated to get our name on the box as well. Mm. Yeah, no, awesome. So Recycle, let's uh, move on to the next one, Rebirth. So this was, uh, oh, yeah. I've got my timeline here, 1997. Yeah. Now, I... I, I um, I haven't seen the program in ages, but I found a splash screen because I remember there was there was some nice there was some comments on the splash screen, and I found the splash screen, and there was a couple of acknowledgements, which I, I, I will get you yeah. to kind of detail a bit. One was there was a Roland acknowledgement on the splash yeah. screen. Mm-hmm. There was also a thank you to Carl Steinberg, and uh, you know here's another one on my bucket list. I'll uh, let me tell you, right? So if I um, if I can get Carl on the show, that would be uh, you know I'd be a happy man. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, and the last one I found interesting was Rodney Orpheus. Now I remember that uh, I remember Rodney's name. He was all over the tech forums and everything else. And I know that he's yeah. got a band. And so I didn't I didn't know where he fit in with the development side of things. So can you um, before we dive into the actual program itself, can you give us a little bit of background on um, th- those two points? You know, the role and acknowledgement, and, yeah. and um, and Carl and Rodney's involvement in Rebirth. 
Yeah, so this was this was really early. This was before I think you know I think this was the first hardware emulation, at least a commercial yes a hardware emulation that was out there on the market. No one had done that before, so we didn't really know what to expect in terms of how that you know the originator Roland as a com- as a company how they would react to that. But mm. we did our homework legally and made sure that we were in the clear uh, for 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 that, and then. And then we we put it up. We put up like an alpha version uh, on the internet, and then we saw that we had Roland.co.jp as one of the <laughs> biggest downloads. Uh-huh. It seemed like everybody <laughs> at Roland were downloading it, and and got us a little bit nervous. But then they contacted us and said, "Okay, we got to talk about this." So we had a meeting with them, and the amazing thing about that was they, the all. They all they wanted was acknowledgement. Right. They said, you know, it's cool that you're doing this. We're not doing these products anymore, and we, you know, we're happy um, that you've, <clears throat> um, you know, made them come alive again. But we do want acknowledgement. Yes. So we came up with a joint statement uh, together with them, which f- from our end was just like, you know, it was a stamp of approval. It was it was an amazing thing that we could use in our marketing. Mm. So they were really gracious about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I later, uh, many years later, got a fax. I don't know if your audience even know what a fax is. Oh, but yeah. it was, uh, <laughs> well, I got a fax from the guy who designed uh, both uh, 303 and the 808. And, you know, he told us how happy it was that we we had done that. Yeah, how, how amazing. Cool we thought it was. So that nice. was amazing. Yeah, it was really nice. Really good people. Yeah, it's not like uh, you guys, uh, it wasn't, there was no blatant copyright stuff there in regards to using their name because look everyone knew what they were you know we looked at them and went oh, yeah, yeah it's yeah, a TB303 yeah. and an 808 and I think you added a 909 yeah. and a later version as well yes but it was uncharted territory like you know they didn't know what to expect yeah no one knew what to expect at the time um uh, the other name you mentioned was Carl Steinberg Charlie Steinberg and that was of course because you know they were they were um uh, they were the bigger company, and and um, th- there was know-how and experience all over that company. I can't remember exactly if there was an incident where he helped us out with something, but I, I'm sure it was Marcus who wanted to put that in. But yep. Steinberg were really helpful as well. Awesome. And Rodney worked for Steinberg, so he was an evangelist, ah. and he really, really went out of his way to promote our stuff, you know, when we were like— I'm making this up, but you know, we were almost like Rodney. You have to talk about Cubase too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he was a little bit. He was really, he was really supportive. Okay, um, that that yeah. has connected the dots for me because I remember the name. Yeah, I remember the name, and he was all over those early Steinberg forums. Um, yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, and he was their demo guy in Frankfurt. That's right. There the you NAM. go. Yeah. yeah. So that, I was that just, was it. Yeah. I was just trying to connect the dots of why the name was so familiar. And uh, there, you've just done it for me. You know, that was a, quite a while ago. Um, so I, I do want to ask you a couple of questions about Rebirth. Um, now, uh, how much of that was actually modelled or sampled, if, if you can share that with us? Yeah, of course. Um, so in the original version, it was the 808 and two 303s and some effects. Mm-hmm. And the 303 was completely modeled like you do today. No, you know, exactly that technology yep. that everybody uses. And the effects, of course, as well, you know, digital effects like they were. And the 808 was a hybrid. So we did actually sample the sounds, but then we we did some some... Yeah, we did some cool stuff like we were able to separate noise from tone in, in the snare drum and put those the levels on separate controls oh, right, like yeah. you could. And then the same thing with some of the tone controls. We emulated the filters, the analog filters that they had. So it was a hybrid. Yep. But there were some samples in there and, and people pretty early found out that there were samples inside. So what they started getting out their um, Mac OS resource editors and replaced the samples inside oh, and right. and made their own version of the application with other sounds in it. And they also replaced the graphics. Yes. So the program not only sounded different, it also looked different. Yes, yes, yes. And we thought that was super cool, but it wasn't 
you know, really practical for us to have people uh, distributing on their own, you know, a modded version of our application. So we put that in actually in an er really early version that you could, um, so you could mod it and we would contain uh, <clears throat> the, the modification resources in the application and you could switch between mods in the app. Yes, yes. Nice. I, yeah. I had dozens of them. <laughs> It <laughs> doesn't. Did you like, make any? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Yeah. But but I collected quite a few of them. <laughs> yeah, that was such a common thing back then that not every company was supportive of. Like I remember all the early trackers and stuff. For like the whole history of that was, uh, some people modded something that somebody else built and redistributed that, and then it branched and branched from there. So really cool that you all supported that. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It yeah. felt like the right thing to do. So where, um, what year did you officially put the 909 in? Because I know that some of those mods, they were, they were hacking the, the 909 sounds into it. Yeah. I can't, I can't remember. It must have been like two years after the release or something. I'm, I'm not sure. So I'm guessing, no, it can't be because 99 we were. So it must have been 98 then. Yeah. And that actually did require Roland's um, approval because – they had a policy where they said that it was okay to sample their analog stuff, but they had had a conflict with another company who had copied ROMs oh. from their hardware. And uh, so they, they said, you know, no digital stuff. You, you can't copy any of the digital stuff. Um, so, we, but we got, but they were, they were okay with that. So 909 was digital? Yeah, partly. Ah, I was about to, oh, well, there you go. Yeah, so the symbols and the hi hat were. Sampled. Ah, uh, there you go. All right. Well, awesome. So, yeah. um, and again, look, I, I, I remember if Recycle caused a paradigm shift, I remember the explosion of creativity and stuff that was coming out with um, with uh, with Rebirth. Now, one thing, though, the copy protection on it was a CD that had to remain in the CD player. Yeah. I had clients yeah. that would wear out their CD, their, their computers, because <laughs> it was always spinning. Right. And I, I that, uh. that was um, oh. that was something where I went, oh, if I could actually get a hold of these guys and say, can you guys uh. actually come up with something a little bit better? Yeah, I haven't heard about that. Yeah, but that's true. We used to see, you know, we had this idea that no one can ever copy a CD-ROM. <laughs> How did you do that? It's too much data. <laughs> oh, hindsight's an amazing thing. <laughs> yeah, but Rebirth actually was the first music software application that someone without, you know, um, lots of prior musical knowledge could fire up and get something going and it would actually sound authentic. Yes. It would sound like something you heard in the club on a Saturday. Yes. And so and no one had done that before. Some other people were doing some great uh, work on DSP and, and, and stuff, but no one else had really packaged it together like we managed to do. So, and then... And people would share songs as well. So we had a website that was also really early because the the file format, the files were so small, it were just kilobytes. Mm. So you could you could upload them to a web server and and download them and you know do remixes of somebody else's song and stuff. It was a really cool culture. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I thought I thought it was a fantastic era in that that late nineties. Uh, and again, look, the computers. You know, we didn't have a lot of horsepower there. You know, we couldn't even run a reverb in real time. But th that little application just cranked. You know, and it was mm. it was great. And uh, mm. it's mm. something that you guys have maintained in um, just the efficiency of the code because um, we can move on to Reason now. And I my first look at Reason was at Nam in the year two thousand. Um, and I think he released it probably a couple of months after I actually first saw it at NAM. Yeah, we showed it at Winter NAM. Yeah, uh, that, in two thousand. Yeah, yep. absolutely. That, so I was there, and um, I found the stand, and I just sat down, and and um, I'm not sure who was demoing it, but I I just sat there. Rodney. Went, it was Rodney. Well, there you go. Mm, it was Rodney coming full circle, and um, I sat there and was listening in on the demo, and. My first thought was, how the f are they managing to pull that much, <laughs> to, yeah. that much out of the computers of the day? Because we're only talking 
P2s and, and whatever the, the Motorola based, I think the G3 or G, might have been G4 uh, at that time, I don't think the G5s had actually hit. There wasn't a lot of DSP horsepower on those chips. And here I am hmm. seeing this, you know, full rack of synthesizers effects and, and then you turn it around and the patch leads would move. I thought that was pretty cool, actually. <laughs> you know? It was super cool. Yeah. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about um, reason? Uh, so it, it's almost, it was almost like rebirth on steroids, kind of. Yeah, the, the thing was when if you look at, back at some, and I think there are some of them out there on the internet actually, if, uh, I can't remember from where, but what our original drawings looked like for even for rebirth, mm -hmm. and some of it looks more like reason than rebirth. Right. And, but the thing was, we we couldn't do it with. We didn't have the process. We didn't have the muscle in the company. We didn't have the people. We didn't have the processing power in the computer, and we didn't. We couldn't do real time. Right. Playing like playing on a keyboard and having the sound come out of your speakers mm. because the latency, the delay between the MIDI input and the sound output was far too long at the time. So that's why we did rebirth, like a, you program it. Mm -hmm. And but then but then computers got better, uh, and then uh, so we said, okay, let's do it like we wanted to do it, and then that was reason. And uh, you you talked about the efficiency there, and that comes from most of that comes from Peter, uh, the DSP engineer, um, who was, was one of the founders. And his background, he'd, he'd already been working both in analog hardware and in digital hardware. Uh, so he sort of had a really, really deep understanding of what's important, you know, where to focus to make something sound good and well, what you can do and what you could do at the time. And at that time, you could also write code much closer to the processor than you do these days, you know, mostly because it's not needed. So he managed to 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 do that in, in, in just an amazing way. Yeah. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you guys did uh, introduce some formats that became, mm -hmm. uh, we'll call them industry standards because they are industry standards. Now, with Recycle, you had the, the Rex format. Um, yep. And now, I'm just, I can't remember whether other DAWs, the DAWs are allowing that to be imported directly onto timelines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, A lot of them did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the other one is... Um, Rewire. Rewire, yeah. Um, yeah. That was an interesting one because... Um, that that popped up on all of the DAWs and and, and it allowed yeah it allowed uh, your application to sync with the the doors um, and also uh, some of the implementations are allowing you know I, know I remember with Cubase you're actually allowing to to pick individual instruments within your rack um, yes so that was pretty deep can can you give us some um, some detail on on Rewire. Yeah, well, there was no, first of all, there was really no, I mean, the VST standard came up at the same time, but it was initially only for effects. Mm -hmm. And that couldn't really have worked for us the way it was because we had a complete application with its own timeline and we wanted to get to run that timeline in parallel with the DAW because we, we at, at that time, and I, it, sort of, I think, actually still shows up in the product. The the love for us is around the sounds and the creative possibilities and the inspiration and, and you know, the Pro Tools is a different beast. If it, we take that as an example, I mean, that's all about workflow and managing your project and recording, you know, 100 channels of audio and that. And we were never about that. We were about... Um, yeah, pop music, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. and, you know, electronica and 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 the musician using the program rather than an engineer. So we we put our we put a sequencer in because we wanted the both in rebirth and reason because we wanted the program to be self-contained so you could make whole songs with it. Yep. But we did understand that you wanted to mix that, the sound that came from our app with whatever else you had, audio recordings and stuff, because we didn't have audio recording at the time. So we invented this protocol where the sound is routed sort of from 
from our app into the DAW and the timelines are synchronized. So you end up having to use, you know, launch both applications at the same time and switch between them, mm. which is a little bit clunky compared to how you use uh, um, plugins today. Mm. But um, it was a working solution yeah. to fix the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure I can't name one door that didn't implement rewire they're, they're no I, I think you know, all of the important doors had it it was a free api sdk that you could get from us am i correct in saying that was co-developed with steinberg well yeah sort of we did it but you know they were our first customers of course they had input but i i don't think there's any of their code in it actually but we designed it together with them so we would work with cubase yeah, yeah. Because from memory, the implementation in Cubase was was better than the others. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Yeah, maybe. You know, like I said previously, you can actually you'd rewire uh, Reason and Cubase together, and then you could drop down and you know you create a MIDI track and go, okay, what instrument? And and you'd see the you'd see the um, the Reason instruments available as a as a virtual instrument so that was mm. that was mm. uh I th i'm not sure look i'm sure maybe some of the other doors did that as well but i remember the cubase implementation was pretty deep with it with uh, mm. and and um i sold a lot of cubase um reason combinations back back then uh -huh. yeah <laughs> yeah well they were our distributor in in the beginning and then we sort of you know each went our own way and yep yeah yeah Awesome. So lots of gratitude for those people as well. I mean, they helped us get to where we mm. got. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then uh, like quite a few years later, or not, you know, yeah, was it around 2009, you come up with Record. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a separate application to Reason. Yes. So you could use Record on its own as a, as a door. Or you could use it uh, in combination with Reason. Yeah. Uh, but they were two separate products, correct? Yes. Completely, yeah. And they, were, they could work independently as well from memory. Uh, yep. I did have a few clients um, experiment with Record, but they, you know, they, they were coming from, you know, Cubase or Pro Tools or Cakewalk, whatever they were using. So it was a, that one was a harder sell. Yeah, no, that was a, that were there were lots of mistake in in our um, you know market analysis around that product. Uh, so what we there were there were a few things. I mean, one was when we started the project, the AWS didn't have a lot of instruments, and but when we finally got the product ready, they did. So they here here come we with this recording application, you know, for singer songwriters and bands, and and uh, you know, and, and it just didn't look like a, a great deal uh, until you put it together with Reason, um, which then it became, that was a really fantastic combo, but on its own, it wasn't. And the other thing we miscalculated was how strong the Reason brand was. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, and I, you, you can actually see that in, in the fact that the company is now called Reason Studios. Yeah, no, of course, yeah. So it was like, you know, um, it, it, what's this? We 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 want reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, what are you trying to sell me? Yeah. yeah. It, it should it should be reason. What's this? So it was no. It didn't take long. I can't remember how long, but it didn't take long until we realized that was a mistake, and we put the two products together, and you know the the features of record became just part of reason. Yeah, that was um, version six. Ah, there you go. Twenty eleven. See, I've got the timeline here. <laughs> Yeah, you do. It's you? it's a bit of a tax for creating such a good product, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that put us really in the category of being a full blown DAW right. with you know all the audio recording and and um, and the features needed for that, and then and the mixer and all the effects and everything that went into that. So, yeah, awesome. Yeah. No, and there was a period there uh, in the middle teens, there to twenty teens that. Um, I did see some data where it was the the second largest used DAW on the market. So mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, they you definitely made a footprint there. <laughs> so yeah. so that was yes. great. Um, I do um, one thing that I do want to chat to you about is that um, the company had a pretty unique approach 
of keeping the the coding uh, closed and in house regards plugins. Now, I've spoken to uh, sorry, we've spoken to a few uh, DAW developers, and a few of them have voiced that if they had their way, they wouldn't. They just wouldn't have VST plugins because <laughs> mm. <laughs> it was a. Uh, a lot of the problems that uh, they they need to navigate and, and um, uh, code wise is to do with the plugin format. So you guys were very unique in the sense that you didn't offer the VST uh, plugin format, and I know that was an area of um, not contention's the wrong word, but there was uh, you know a bit of um, angst. Angst. The angst would be the word. Yeah. 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 That's almost my name, so that makes right. sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, 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 what, what happened was we were doing all this stuff, and then we were looking at, you know, we were using other DAWs, and this is early VSC days, so people who make music now won't have the same experience, but it wasn't really a good experience. Mm. And the most, it was something still remained, some problems, what, we, what I think is, a, is some, you know, a, f- a feature of actually not, the best possible design but most of it's gone but at the time the 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 biggest problem was that if your plugin crashed right so you could have you would have your your DAW from a big manufacturer that had rigorous testing and you know beta versions and test rigs and stuff and then you would put in a plugin from from some person who just started coding and if the plugin crashed it, it will take it would take down the whole uh, DAW including your document meaning you would lose any unsaved changes mm-hmm. and so there there was all that stuff around that and there's no undo um you know that wasn't even that wasn't connected it was a lot of things and not to mention the fact what happens and that's still true i think um well, if you buy a new computer and you want to reinstall your system, mm. I mean, how long does that take for a system with, you know, 50 plugins or whatever? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah of course. Finding all the licenses and everything. That was crazy. So we said, so we made a list of all that stuff uh, that we said, we can't, we can't have this. We, we, want, a, we want a technology that's better than this, you know, the, uh, the world deserves that. And then we've, we, dis- we made a list of stuff that we wanted to fix. We designed the thing around that. And then we said, okay, so if this is really going to work, it means that all the plugins need to be central on our server. So you could just hit download and they would all get installed automatically, which is the way it still works with rack extensions. You know, right. install reason and click one button and all your plugins get installed. Right. You have to do anything. Yeah. And, um, and then we said, okay, wow, that means we have them on our server. <laughs> we should probably sell them too. That makes sense that, you know, the money would go through us. How would it otherwise work? Mm -hmm. And so we said, and so what does that mean? We, you know, we're going to have a a thing with it, like a web store with plugins and they're going to, and manufacturers going to upload their products to our system. And, you know, it's like, this is too weird. No, no one's done this before. It doesn't make sense. Mm. We can't, we won't be able to explain this to people. And then. Apple started the App Store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that is the best thing that could happen to us, but because then we could just say it's like the App Store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we we built all that, and we, you know, um, it's still there and glorious, and there are all kinds of cool things coming out, and you know, there are over, I think, and I think about eight hundred products or something in that store. Not all of them rack extensions, but you know, synthesizers and effects and players and utilities and stuff that you can buy and, and run in reason. But then eventually we said, and uh, this is now we're coming up almost to the point where I'm, I left the company. But we said, you know, this is yeah, this that that was a nice move you know, years ago, that made sense. Then it doesn't make any sense anymore. Mm. So we've done two big changes. Then first we allowed VSTs and other formats in Reason as a DAW. And then we've turned the rack itself into a plugin that you can use in other DAWs. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. So now you have, you know, you can work whatever way 
you want. You can you can use our DAW for your entire production, or you can start your project there and export stuff and move into another DAW, or you can start in your other DAW and still use the rack and you know with combinators and cables and all that stuff inside mm. Ableton or Logic or whatever. So with with the rack extensions, so even all of the third party plugins that are uh, developers that have, have designed plugins and virtual instruments in that format, you, the, the clients can go to your servers and go, right, reinstall the whole lot all in once. Yeah. One, bu- one button yeah. to click. Yeah. Download and install everything. Yeah. And, that, and that's because Basically. you've maintained that that control yeah in, in, we, look you know the vst the the someone left the gate open in you know 1997 yeah, 98 it'd right. be impossible right. to actually do that i mean there's some companies that have compiled a whole stack of um you know smaller developers uh you know plugin alliance and those those type of guys which is kind of yeah, good it's okay yeah they're kind of yeah, good if you buy a package from arturia or something you know you get your your arturia stuff installed but you know, a lot of us have plugins from from multiple manufacturers, and then, but it wasn't only that; it was some other things that we're doing that no one else is doing yet. I think is you know we we abstracted the whole, the code in a way so that what we have on our service isn't actually the thing that gets delivered to the user, but it's like um um it's a virtual machine thing where where so we compile for for Mac OS or Windows. Sort of in not exactly in real time, but you know, as it gets downloaded, that was that's not true. It's pre-compiled, but we can, you know, when when uh, companies like Microsoft and Apple make changes to their operating systems, we can we can still recompile new versions, and the original developer of the rack extension doesn't need to do right uh, wow. anything. Yeah, yeah. So they're platform independent. Yeah, no, that's very good. I mean, the, the point I was making with Plugin Alliance. Look, the individual developers obviously have their their um, their applications for installing and activation, and and some of them are quite good. You know, native instruments and yeah. Tune Track, and you know, there's a whole host of them that do it very very well. Um, with the Plugin Alliance one that I made the point of, that they don't have any specific plugins of their own. They're they're like a portal right. for the for third party plugin developers. And there's a whole host of them, and then you fire up their, um, you know, their, their application manager, and there's all your listed plugins, and they're all from different manufacturers, and you go bang, and then you can install them all at once. I thought that was yeah, that's great. That was actually quite good as well. Um, yeah, that's great. That, that's the closest to what you guys, <clears throat> sorry, that what you guys come up with with rack extensions. But uh, mm. so um, the VST. Uh, hold, uh, we'll call it the VST holdout. That was 2017. Yeah, benched. yeah, that was a long time. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm yeah. trying to. You're uh, <laughs> so you know. I'm giving you a golf clap there because that was. Uh, I, I could just imagine the pressure coming from some sectors of the community and and the industry about why are oh you yeah. going? Yeah, are you going to do VST three? VST yeah. two? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, looking back, we could we could probably have done it earlier, but um, you know, we we um, that yeah, it was just we've always been about making sure that people can focus on the actual music and the music making and spend as little time as possible on on boring stuff like getting things to work and installing and you know protecting them as well as we can in terms of crashing and stuff. Yeah. So it didn't really make sense for a long time, and also. I mean, things are just generally so much better with computers these days, I think, in terms of stability and compatibility. And, mm, yeah. You know, so so that, 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 was, that was a good decision at the time. Yep. That you, you know, you, would, you wouldn't do it that way today. Mm. I, I think, um, well, you missed a lot of the pain. <laughs> <laughs> that some yeah. that some of the other DAW uh, developers had expressed to us. There are all kinds of pain, then. Yes, uh, <laughs> good, bad, good and bad. <laughs> uh, yes. So, and did you uh, did you end up isolating the VSTs, or did, was it just that things were mature enough that 
Yeah, we we, we did some stuff for even on our VST implementation a little bit, but not too much. I mean, there, a lot of companies have been doing that. I think like I, I've sort of been out of the loop for a while now, but I remember when Bitwig came out that they had done a lot of really clever work for making sure that the DAW was protected yes. even if the VST yes, was yeah. going yes, down. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So they've they've done more work on that than than Reason Studios have, but um, we've done some. Mm. 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 Awesome. Hey, um, I've got a question, re the community, because that's kind of shifted a little bit in the sense that, um, and I'm not sure what year, but you guys closed down your official forums at some point. Yes, we did. Yeah. Mm, we did. It, it just became too toxic. Um, there were some people there, and, 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 there was some, and it had nothing to do with us. You know, it was users... Um, the way users were treating each other, and you know, we're a music software company, not a not a not a social media company. And Facebook was around, and you know, all those companies were around at the time. So it was just like we can't, we we don't we don't know how to deal with this. We don't understand the psychology or have the technology to to take care of this. So it was just like, no, we can't we can't do this anymore. Yeah. I don't. I don't know why that was. Why that happened? I can't really understand it. But there's some. You know, it was unfortunately quite a small uh, amount of people who were. It always is. Mm. It always yeah, is. yeah. I remember one guy. That's more of a funny story. He started two accounts and and started fighting with himself. Oh yeah, they call that <laughs> yeah the sock sock puppet. Yeah, right. the sock puppet uh, type. Oh, they do that. That's that's something that people do. Yeah, see yeah, they, yeah, sock, yeah. Uh, sock puppet. That's just like, why, why, you know. It, there have been plenty of places <sighs> that have shut their forums down or turned off commenting or any of this stuff. So certainly not you all. Yeah. No. Consider yourself a pioneer in that area. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did have, you know, even or going back to Rebirth, we had those that website where you could share your files and right. with your music that you made. So that was that was around. Uh, you know, MP3 days. Mm. Yeah, um, that, was, that was that was early. Look, for, forums in general, um, and myself and Pete have had plenty of discussions about this. And you know, the toxicity. You can count mm. the members that um, poison the the pool, so to speak, on one hand. Mm. Seriously, any forum, <laughs> there, there's usually mm. you know, hold your hand up. There's probably less than five people that. Uh, there's probably more, but in 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 the areas that um, because they're all compartmentalised and people go into specific areas of the forum, but I know that in the music technology areas of the, the forums that I still frequent and participate on, and I'm participating less. There's mm. there's less than a handful of people that are just there for no other reason than to pick holes. Uh, you know, it's it's you know the peanut gallery, uh -huh. and and anything that you post, they've got to find. They got to leave us, you know. They, they got to get a little bit of leverage to start some type of conflict or, or an argument. And I think that mm. that's what that that's their energy. I don't I don't know why, but again, that's not. Look, I, I used to get involved in um, some forum stouches. I'm probably, you know, the, you know, in the early two thousands, I was probably renowned for being someone that was probably a little bit overly vocal <laughs> in some areas. Oh, um, I see. And, 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 Vin was one of the people that caused you to shut down the forums here. Exactly. No, no. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm getting. <laughs> no, I, I was, I was, um, yeah, I was known to be, um, I was no shrinking violet, put it that way. I, I, I'd, <laughs> um, I'd hold my own, but I never openly abused anyone. But I, <laughs> I remember being banned for diagonally abusing people. I'm going, how the hell do you diagonally oh. abuse people? Because I don't abuse people directly. I don't know how it works. Yeah, I don't abuse. Right. I, oh, I, see. I don't I abuse them directly, but it was indirectly. So they come up with a term of you're diagonally mm. abusing people, so you're out. I've gone, okay. So I come up with a term called diagonalese, which was pretty pretty hilarious at the time. While well, amongst myself and my own uh, admin and mods <laughs> on my own forum, we had we had a sub forum that was, um, you know, interpreting diagonalese. So we just come up and you know reinterpret certain <laughs> things and you know this new form of language that we'd uh, created. Um, but, yeah, forums have always been uh, toxic. The other thing that was complicated at the time was, which, again, I don't think so much, you guys probably know better than I, but there was so much 
angst around the technology. You know, is this technology good enough for my music? <laughs> Uh, and and you know what what does it mean? It was everything from fixed point to floating mm, point, mm. Uh, you know all, all that stuff and and sample rates and conversions and everything. And oh people boy. were really worried that they you know they were sort of taken advantage of. I think was the was the fear, right? This is this company and they're selling me something that's supposed to be professional and it maybe it isn't and maybe I devote myself to this and in my music career. So there was all, all the people were people were trying to understand it and people were trying to talk about it and trying to do their own experiments with stuff. And it was really complicated. So a lot of it was you know a lot of misunderstandings and and misinformation, frankly, I think, and that was not that's not for us uh, specifically. Um, um, you know, it was for all the DAW manufacturers, mm. I think. And and but I, it doesn't it doesn't happen that it, it's not that way anymore, is it? Mm. Yes. Mm. You kind is of it? still, you know, this is why <laughs> okay. so many companies don't release the internal information about how their products work like that in the right. music industry because people will always find something it's like what it's only this many kilohertz instead of this many kilohertz yeah. oh it's gonna make right. my music suck and it's like use oh, your okay. ears use your ears mm. yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. yeah we were always always big advocates of, of you know true blind tests as well to see can, is this actually something that the stuff we're talking about is it actually something you can hear <laughs> and then you sit there and you know that there are things that you can actually hear that people are not talking about. Right. So, so it was, uh, yeah, it, was, it, could, it could be tough at times. Mm. Yeah, the good, old, the good old double blind tests on uh, yes on the forums. Uh, that, that's usually the domain of the audio interface and, and the converter um, officiators. Right, exactly. Man, yes. yep. some of those yep. threads, <laughs> you know. It's, it's the modern armchair quarterback stuff, right? Right, right. Okay, so that that's still happening. Oh, because oh. I don't follow it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. If if you accidentally step in some of it, like yeah, that's oh, a, becomes sorry. a mess. Yeah, myself, okay. myself, and Pete have accidentally stepped in on some of the Apple threads, and and we're we're, uh -huh. <laughs> we're there just trying to be as objective as possible, but because we're not Apple people, it's just it, you you just can't do it. I've given up even attempting. It's you're mm. constantly walking on eggshells. But I, I mean, I'm I'm constantly being battered for my door bench project because people are always right. picking holes th right. through it. And I, I, I spoke with Pete and Chris in the last um, podcast. And I've gone, I, you know, it, it gets exhausting, and I'm still navigating mm. it this week. Where the people are just coming up with some of the most, uh, I don't know, a minuscule type of things, and and they always make it out. It's why aren't you doing this? Because it's so easy and it's so logical, and, and this will be far more right, real right. world. And and it's all great. They come up with these, you know, scenarios of how to come up with a, mm. a benchmark, but never yeah. do it. it. They never it, do it. Ernst, it's like why, why don't you support VST? It's so easy. It's just a little yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 that's always. Um, Oh, look, I hate using the word challenge, but I mean that's the challenge for me is the, is to block out a lot of that. And um, hmm. I, the best way for me to 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 do that is that I don't respond to the obvious baits. I just I don't respond, and and it's across multiple forums. So um, I, I don't participate on forums much simply because of the toxic. It's the it is it's there. The toxicity is there. Um, I'm not understanding. Why these people have such energy against what I'm mm. doing when I when I'm uh -huh. offering this stuff to the community for for free, the time and energy, and it's like wow, you know what? There's various points where I've gone, oh man, I don't know if I can keep doing it's, this. It's you good know? that you're getting this all out in the open, Vin. I'm glad that we could help you with this therapy. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is the therapeutic session in the middle of a podcast. Yeah, oh, right. Oh, mm. God. Sorry, guys. Um, well, look, the, the other thing that I do want to mention about um, the community forums for uh, reason is that uh, it looks like the official ones closed down. I was reading a little bit. I think there was two... There was two kind of um, errors, so to speak. You shut one down and you started up another one and then you went, no, nope, enough of that, and then you moved to the social media. 
But there's mm. there's a conventional forum that's run by the community. Um, yes. Which is I, I had a bit of a poke through that. That seems. Look, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of posts there, and it seems to be very very well run. So that's kind of good that, okay. that the community has picked up the ball and done that. Uh, yeah, I, I the whole thing with forums versus social media for me is a two edged sword because um, I communicate on both, uh, but if if you start a communication thread on something like Bookface. It's very mm. difficult. It, the, I mean, the train of um, the train of communication and the dialogue gets lost very, very quickly because it's not sequ- it's not in a se- right. sequential type of format like right. like the um, the regular forums. So, which one do I prefer? I actually prefer communicating. Uh, well, just to find information, I actually prefer the the, the forums. But it, they're they're a dying mm. breed. They are a dying breed. Yeah, yeah there were there's some places like Reddit and you know oh. where you got more long form stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I actually, you know, I, I'm the wrong guy to talk to. I've, I've shut down most of everything. I'm only on on Twitter, and I very rarely post. I just. You know, and that's mostly because I'm interested in politics and you know, it has nothing to do with music. So I'm, I don't do Facebook or Instagram or any of that anymore. I don't think you're missing much. You're not. You're not. Uh, you're not really. It wasn't good for me. I wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't healthy for me. Yeah. Well, look, all of them can be toxic environments, but I I find that the toxicity level on Facebook, surprisingly for me, is less. So okay, I, I have. I have. Various fans that follow me around on forums have for fifteen years that you know will always pop in their their two cents of peanuts, um, but I, I get it less. I get it's far more respectful on on Facebook, which that's so bizarre. It is. Mm. Uh, I pretty much quit using Facebook because it was as mm. opposite to what you're saying as you yeah. can get. Yeah, no, and I'm just talking only for my door bench. Only from only yeah. from yeah. my door yeah. bench pages. Yeah. Oh, so that's I'm great. I'm finding then. it far more respectful. Um, the people are actually posting under their real names. Well, you know, well, more people are posting under their real names, and I, I find that if people actually um, take accountability of what they're actually posting and saying under um, a name that you can track easier than on a forum, because the forum they just come up with, uh, you know, um, some. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, well, no, hi- that's one of the keys yeah. that people are talking, you know, yeah. posting under their real yeah, names. Yeah, they're hiding under their anonymity. Yeah. I mean, I've lost count how many times mm. I've had people that have come in and I've, I've tried to um, have a, an objective conversation with them and then all of a sudden they add homin and attacks at start. I've gone, listen, before we go any further with this, I, I don't know who you are. I don't even know who I'm communicating with. So before we go any right. further, can you want to step out from behind your cloak? No. Nah. You know, mm. so I think that's what, uh, you know, if forums need to make a comeback, they need to drop the anonymity and that's never going to happen. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, but um, the social media platforms, I think, I reckon there's going to be a, a, a drop off. I've already felt it. Um, mm-hmm. you, you've already said you don't participate. I don't, I don't, I don't do anything on. But I'm old. I'm an yeah, old but person. so you know, so am I, man. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but I, I, um, I don't participate on Facebook um, at all, mm. apart from mm. you know the door bench, a bit of company stuff. Uh, that's about it. I, I don't, I don't participate on you know personal timelines much anymore. I know Pete pretty much evacuated the area as well, so it's mm. interesting. Yeah, um, I've never tweeted. You know, I know Pete likes his his Twitter. I've never tweeted. I, f- I find Twitter the most toxic uh, arena on the planet. So on, on Twitter, I stay away from pretty much anything that's controversial, and yeah, and that self censorship has actually made it a reasonable place. Yeah, mm. and, and controversial is super broad. Yeah, mm. but it's it's just it's yeah. just good that it, the trolls haven't followed you across, Pete. Is that all I can say? Because they're just you know. Mm. I just find it, I find it, um, yeah, a little bit more toxic than all the others. So, um, so that's the community stuff. So, now you, uh, Angst, you left the company in 2019. And let me just be clear yep. for the listeners in, you were the CEO from 1994 to 2019, which is 
a pretty amazing <laughs> effort to to lead that company all of that time. Um, hmm. Can you um, give us a um, you know any personal thoughts or uh, of um, that era of you know when you you chose to step down? You don't need to if you don't want to if you're not comfortable about no, it. No, no, that, that's fine. That's fine. There are no no you know no secrets really. Well, it's an end of an it's an end of an era, so it's an interesting. Uh, I think it might be an interesting point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we started this company so long ago. I mean, the word startup didn't really exist even at the time. Mm-hmm. So we, we, you know, just some guys um, using long weekends and evenings to build something, and you know, took that money and put it into the next product. And we had no idea about anything about how to run a company. So we just, you know, we figured it out all along. And with Peter and Marcus being in development, <clears throat> you know, they, of course, they learned and built a lot of things in that area, but uh, a lot of the other things were left to me. So, you know, things like marketing and, and you know, running an organization and stuff. So I, I, was, I, was, I was so fortunate in that I could, um, you know, you can think, how can one person work at the same company for so long, and for me, it wasn't the same company. Right, of course. It, it was growing, and and I was doing different things, and and being able to, you know, put my my energy and my curiosity into different aspects of running a business. But then Marcus decided to leave. I think it was already in twenty thirteen. Mm-hmm. Yes, and. Because he wanted to do other things, you know, he was he was like, if I want to give it another shot to to start again, then this I got to do it now before it's too late. Mm-hmm. And and uh, then after a while, then we decided that it was time to <clears throat> to to let somebody else in. So we um, we found a, a bigger investor, um, a Swedish venture capital company called Verdain, Swedish Norwegian. Mm-hmm. Super nice people and still were really good partners, and I'm so happy we were uh, we're still able to work with them. And so they came in so that Marcus could sort of you know get out completely. And and Peter still works there, and I stayed for another two years. And then they got a real CEO to take over, and uh, uh, you know I'm still on the board and and I'm still working with with them, but it's other people running the company now. And it's also taking a slightly different direction, which is which is great. Mm. Right? So now these days, now a lot of the focus is on the, the it's, it's, it's a little bit going back to our roots, putting so much energy into the instruments and the effects and the creative parts. And also then and and you know and and presenting that the what we think is the core of reason the rack and the way the instrument works and how they feel and how they sound and and making that available to people using other DAWs and then at the same time switching um to another revenue model you know a subscription model which very few companies have done yet mm. in this business oh that's so that's we're, growing. we're sort of still figuring that out yeah it's absolutely growing yeah. and 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 avid did it a few years ago with pro tools but if you look around and you will see that the other products that are out there on subscription like um oh my god um output arcade for instance they built that the product for for that they didn't take a product that they already had mm. and and uh changed it so that but it's a completely different ball game so now you know we have to really live up to um the the continuity of of a subscription service so there are new sound packs coming every week and right you know there's all that stuff and all that stuff happening so so yeah it's it's in, in a way it's still the same company you know it's still the same same mission that we're on, but also th- things have changed mm. dramatically. Let me put you on the spot for a second. Uh, sure. Uh, in all that time that you were, you know, the founder and CEO and everything, like, is there one thing that you look back on and think, "Wow, this was this is my proudest moment. This is the best thing that I did during all that time." Oh, I see. And this is out oh, of the blue. So an interesting question. Yeah, no, that's fine. Let me think. Uh, I, I, maybe I'll, I can answer another question 
Okay. And I can remember the exact moment when, you know, we we went from thinking we're just three guys fumbling around, uh, you know, not knowing what they're doing, and and when it sort of changed, and that was when we showed already when we showed Rebirth at Nam, mm -hmm. uh, on a Steinberg press conference, and <laughs> we had all these this music press, and I they'd shown a lot of stuff, and at the end it was Rebirth, and I was playing something. And uh, and then I heard one of the reporters from the back yelling, crank it up! <laughs> <laughs> and I did. And there was this like kind of club sound going on and they were all going like, yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. And then there were standing ovations after that. So I felt like, you know, I had to call back home to Sweden and say, guys, I think this, this could actually be working. Nice, nice. That's so a great I, moment. So I remember that. Yeah, that was a great moment. But in terms of any specific decision or anything that I did, it doesn't doesn't feel like it was that way. You know, so yeah. constant, constant, <laughs> constant agony. <laughs> you know, two, two steps forward and one step back. Right. No, it was no, it was been a it's it was a lot of fun. I'm so happy I, I I've been able to do this. So, but um, yeah, nice. Yeah, well, I um. Yeah, I just <laughs> I could just uh, imagine that uh, just the energy in that room when uh, you know when, when you crank that up and the whole place lit up and that's uh, that's awesome. That, that would have been yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. really awesome. Well, look, I, I still remember the reaction of um, of reason uh, in two thousand. And now yeah. I wasn't there when you mm. look. I doubt very much it would have been the first unveiling of it, but uh, I, I still remember the reaction uh, in in the in the seated gallery. It pretty much was. And I remember talking to this guy from Yamaha <laughs> afterwards who said that they had sent him there to check out what the new cool trends in hardware was. Right. And he said, I'm going to go back and tell the motorcycles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a classic. That's, 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 that's awesome. <laughs> Well, it was a shift. I mean, it was a shift. You know, there was the recording part that had already happened. You could see that the tape recorder was sort of gone. But then it was the the everything else around the studio. You could sort of imagine effects and stuff. Mm. But then what we did was made it um, obvious that also instruments like synths and samplers and stuff. Yep. Yep was going to go into the computer and, you know, it was all going to go there. Yep. And now, again, yes. I'll say it again. It was going, each product for me yeah. changed the game uh, to the point where, mm. wow, we can do that. And and the other thing that, w that still amazes me to this day is that you did it with the technology of the day, uh, computer-wise, yeah. where we were really struggling. We were really struggling trying to run a stack of instruments or a stack of effects and but as the computer technology evolved, everything was moving very, very quickly. Um, but mm. you were years ahead of everyone else. I mean, especially Reason. I mean, the amount of stuff you could you could pull out of that with the technology of the day was, mm. again, still amazes me. And, you know, I can only give you a golf clap for that one because that was uh, the, the, the code level optimization that that, um, that Peter uh, uh, pulled off on that was you know, very impressive. Yeah, and he did that inside the envir environment that, that Marcus built for him, sort of, you know, to put it all together. And, you know, they were working very closely together. And then there were other people as well who did great work at the time. But, yeah, for sure. Yep. I had nothing to do with that part. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with your with your current position still on the board, do, do you have a say in any of the direction of the company regards products or uh, any more or not? No, not not really. Right. No. Okay. Not really. Yeah. You know, we we can talk about more. It's it's on a higher level where we want to go with the company in terms of yeah, you know, changes that are happening in, in more on, on a higher level but not on a product. Right. Not with kind of the, okay. the typical approach. But I'm yeah. still happily surprised every, you know, every time something new comes out and the there's more stuff coming this year as well, so you know it's all cool. And I, so I haven't seen. I know some of what's going on, but I haven't seen it yet. So I'm looking forward to ah, that. Awesome. I, I still use the stuff. Mm. Well, so do millions of others. <laughs> yeah. So Pete, you were about to ask something. 
No, I was saying that that's, you know, it, it sounds difficult, but I mean, that's the typical approach that companies take when they, you know, move the, the subject matter expert and CEO um, off to a board position. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy with the way things are. It's absolutely what it should be. And, you know, and also knowing that Marcus had left and where things were going when it was actually time for me to step down, it was my own decision, and you know I had a had a lot of time uh, to process it because you know you, of course you can have a sense of loss when you've been working on some project for you know twenty mm, years and you're yeah. leaving it. But but I, I had I had so much time to prepare, so it was it's all good. Hmm. Now I'm gonna I've got another question that might put you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> um, Go on. Just uh, your your thoughts on the current landscape with the music technology in general. Oh, um, if if you can, <laughs> if you can share. I no no I think I can, and um, I I really like what's going on now. I think there was a period where. I thought the industry was sort of delusional in that it had this idea that it was just going to, you know, what we're we're doing groundbreaking technology and and you know changing stuff every, you know and it, the next thing is going to make everything change in people's musical lives and and I'm just like we I'm not sure that's what mm. we need. Mm. You know, we need we need nice environment nice friendly um exciting environments where we can experiment and do fun stuff and 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 that will make us sound great and i think we're there hmm. so but so so right now i think it's everything's going in a direction that suits me very well and you know and it's not only in software but also a little bit i it took me a while to understand what was going on around all this modular stuff mm. and i was like what is why is this stuff coming back because <laughs> my my experience going back even to pre midi and trying to make music you know the idea then was that i wanted to make music the way you would do in a daw today mm. but it was absolutely impossible because the technology was not there so then when i see the same technology coming back i'm like why are we doing this you know like why why are we taking the engine out of the car uh, and and uh, i don't know i'm putting pedals in or whatever it is i don't know if the metaphor works but now i understand it and i can see that all this stuff is just people are just having a lot of fun and you know finding whatever way they can into that that happens to fit them with the way that makes what whatever makes them feel creative, and I think that's great. Mm. I wasn't sure where you're going with that. I was nervously looking at the wall of modular behind. <laughs> no, but, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, when you when you knew that you yeah. you, you were in studios, you try to get paid for making the goddamn arpeggiator sync with the drum <laughs> yeah. machine and or whatever it was, right. or some CV thing running from a, a, a from a microcomposer to a something, I don't oh, yeah. know, an ARP, whatever, you know, and it never really worked. Right. It's like, why are we doing that again? But that's not what we're doing. I mean, that's the point. We're doing something else. Yeah. 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 Uh, look, I think um, uh, everything's starting to, it's like back to the future almost, you know, uh, things, uh, people are wanting to get something, uh, get back to something a little bit more organic, you know, hands on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. So that whole analog, we'll call it the analog resurgence. Pete's got a wall of He's got a you know a cave. Oh, Sorry, he hasn't got. He's got a cave <laughs> full of analog and digital hybrid synthesizers. So you know he's he's knee deep, neck deep. I've got a I've got a few synthesizers as well. Um, I, I think it it's is all the that, stuff I wanted as a teenager, but couldn't, couldn't afford. afford back yeah, then. <laughs> right. <You know. laughs> uh, look, I uh, and I think it, it's the thing that um, you know. Look, we we were. Back in the day, because of the, the limits of the technology, we were pushing the envelope because of the, you know, because of the, it, yeah. it was so, you know, generic and, and, and it was, um, you know, cutting edge. We'll call it bleeding. It wasn't cutting edge. It was bleeding edge. So we were learning mm. on our feet with all of that technology, the early MIDI, the sequences, all of that type of stuff and the analog. I loved learning um, sound design and uh, with my early analog synthesizers and uh, very early on in the, um, you were saying that um, 
when you were working with that distributor, you were getting hired by studios to do sound design and synth programming. I, they, like, I was mm. doing this very similar type of stuff. They'd come in, they'd say, we need, you know, these particular sounds. I, I remember there was a um, an opera here in Melbourne. He, he, it was only, mm-hmm. th- I think it took the guy four years to write it, and I think there was two performances. And in the middle of the wow. orchestra, in the middle <laughs> of the orchestral pieces, there were some electronic elements. And one of my clients was actually commissioned to do it, but then something came up, and he said, do you, "Vin, do you think you can do this?" And I went, "Well, what does he need?" He says, "Well, he needs, you know, a half a dozen or maybe eight or ten sounds, and and a MIDI rig, and basically you have to teach the keyboard player who was playing, um, you know, piano and and I think harp." Um, harpsichord, um, uh, you'd have to give him some instruction around the MIDI rig because he needs to trigger these uh, synth elements during the middle of the opera. I went, okay. So I went in, had a meeting with the composer, uh, said, you know, what do you need? He says, well, I need a kind of like a plink sound with a, and a you know, and he's, kind of, <laughs> he's actually trying <laughs> to imitate the sound right. and with a little bit right. of a flutter of a string and a filter and I've gone... Okay, so I'm listening in, and I've, I've actually programmed this stuff up for him, and then, and then we went into rehearsals, and I remember we were, I was in the middle of this, uh, uh, you know, ABC um, recording hall for you know designed for orchestras. So the whole orchestra is sitting there, and I'm setting up my little synth rig. Well, it wasn't it was a controller keyboard and a rack, and and um, I looked at one of the techs and went, "Where's the power?" Oh no. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Horns don't need power. And, and they're looking around, going, "Power, mate. It's yeah. I need, I need power, electricity. What? And I've gone and an amplifier. Hey, <laughs> it was. Let's say it was pretty awkward because it took him about half an hour to find the stuff. That's uh, funny. And I held up the start of the rehearsal, and you could you imagine there's an eighty piece orchestra sitting there. And they're all tapping there going, what the fuck? <laughs> what, what are we doing? Mm. Right? And I've gone, mm. ah, wait for some electricity. So uh, that was uh, that was one of my yeah. synth programming uh, jobs, which uh, is mm. always stuck in my mm. mind. It was pretty hilarious. So two rehearsals, a couple of performances, and, uh, you know, that was it. But, I, you know, that was uh, – me getting thrown in the deep end of synth programming, and um, it was it yeah. was great. Just just the brief that he gave me, what sounds he wanted, was still sticks in my mind. It was hilarious, but I man- <laughs> managed to get <laughs> something vaguely what he had in his head, you know, which was which was awesome. Um, yeah, but uh, back to the idea of how things are now. You know, I I. The, I imagine there must have been a time where people had the same ideas about electric guitars that, you know, wh- how, wh- what's this actually going to be? Mm. And then at some point it, it matures and, and you can start to appreciate the workmanship and the individuality of the instruments and not focus so much on the fact that it's new technology. And I think we are there now with synthesizers and, yeah. and, and both software and hardware. And I, I really appreciate that because it, it, it it gives more focus to the music than to the technology, mm. which yeah, I, I think it's come full circle. Yeah. Uh, and even even yeah. with the guitar uh, area, acoustic area, you know, everyone remember that whole thing with the unplugged, right. you know, uh, un, unplugged era. Um, and I enjoy listening to acoustic versions of you know uh, electronic, you know, well, not electronic, but um, acoustic versions of uh, rock songs stripped back, mm. acoustic guitar. A piano and a voice. Uh, mm. If your song can, if you can hold the song with those three elements, and that's a song, you know, that's uh, it's awesome. Mm. So I, I think it has come full circle, um, and, and it's interesting, uh, you know, talking to some of my clients that have dived back into that analog uh, area, and, um, and and look, some of them are not even using media. They, they they've gone all back to the old CV gate clock and the whole thing. They're going. You know, yeah, f- full blown. I think Pete Pete's probably in the middle of that as well with some of his stuff. Um, oh, but MIDI is all throughout. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, MIDI is great. That was a, that was a blessing that that happened. Yeah. yeah. I don't know where we'd been otherwise. Well, it's interesting. Pete's on the board for MIDI too. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually getting pretty excited about that. So, ah, uh, but nothing you can share. No, nothing I could share now. Uh, other than yeah, we're working on MIDI two and Windows. So, yeah, hmm. well, it's great. Very, very good. Um, well, un unless there is anything else you guys want to chat about, I think we've pretty much covered a nice gamut. Um, yeah. Hmm. No, I don't think I don't. I don't have anything. Right. Okay. That's fine. Well, that I don't feel I didn't get to say. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, um, let me thank both of you guys again for your time and energy. That that was fantastic. And um, I can thank you. Uh, Thanks, Ange. I can now. Uh, you know, I'm I'm crossing you off my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, my God. bucket list for, <laughs> sounds ominous. Well, you know, I, I've got I've got a very very short list, uh, and seriously, I've got a very it's a tiny bucket. Yeah, it's a tiny bucket. Right. There's a very short list of um, music technology pioneers from from that early to late nineties. Um, I mentioned another one. Uh, I think he's going to be a that's going to be a hard call. But um, th there's probably another. Oh, there's probably only one other company that I really want to speak to from from that era that I considered to mm. be, you know, changing the game. I hate to, you know, but when you mm -hmm. were saying that uh, you know people were we had that stale period for a while, and, and I, too many times I'm hearing there's going to be game changing. This is going to be game changing, and it didn't. You know, it just sounded more like sham wow ads to me because it didn't change anything. Yeah, uh, but the thing is, I don't. It, for me, that the I don't think that's even a. There's, I don't see that. You know, maybe this sound makes me sound like an old fart, but I don't. There's no. There, I don't see a big need for changing the game right now. Maybe there will be another period. But what would it be? What right would now? It seems what's great. Yeah, what would it be? Ah, uh, but if you know that. Then start a company. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. I think I know what it wouldn't be, which has been tried a few times. Is that is have more of the music right itself. Uh, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Funny because I was just thinking that the next big thing is going to be AI related. <laughs> AI neural network, <laughs> and, music. and it probably is. And <laughs> and Apple just invested in a company that does uh, automatic background music. Mm. Uh, so there, there's, of course, that'll happen. But I think for people like us, you know, it's just as much the experience of of doing it yourself. Yeah. I don't know. It's probably like pottery or something. Of course, you can have a machine do a great cup, and that's more even than, <laughs> mm -hmm. than you can. But but being that's not why we're doing it. We want to sit there and feel the clay between our Correct. fingers. And, yeah. And, and and because that's the experience that you're after as much as the result. That'd be a good title for the uh, podcast. Feel the clay between your fingers. Feel the clay. Well, I'll, might, I'll do that as a as a uh, sub a sub uh, subject line, <laughs> subtitle. Yeah. There you go. And I think there's there's been no greater time in 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 music production history than now to just for for a lot of people to have that experience. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the tools are there, the computer technologies are there. There's really no excuses, uh, even though there's plenty of excuses being made. But there's really no <laughs> no excuses for people that can't just dive in with what's available and make some amazing art. And a lot of people are. A lot of people are. And they are. Yep. Yeah, sixty thousand tracks per day uploaded to Spotify. What? Yes. Yeah, but you know, qu quality versus quantity, though. No, oh, Vin, don't, don't, let's not start that conversation. Okay, that's, that's another rabbit warren. All right, let's that's not go there. <laughs> All right. Well, look, with that, guys, again, thank you very, very much for your time and energy today. Thank you. Um, uh, look, I had a, that, that was awesome. Uh, that was, uh, I had a great time chatting to both of you guys again. And, um, and, and if you ever want to come back, you're more than welcome. Um, to, to yeah. oh. come back on, and, uh, and it doesn't necessarily need to be propeller head. Even if we get you on a, like a tech bite no. show, or you know, just some type of opinion sure. piece thing, because we do have some shows that are not specific to the developers or the pioneers. We have um, you know, like a tech overview type of uh, shows that hmm. myself and Pete and um, uh, do with uh, various uh, guests. And so you know, maybe we can grab you in, and you know, you can you can uh, come in and. Um, 
uh, you know, give some time and energy on one of those in the future. That would be awesome. That'd be yeah. great. Awesome. Yeah, just let me know. All right, yeah, then. For sure. Okay, then, guys, uh, with that, um, on to the next. Next.